Let's break this down as you suggest we break it down into right now the problem with supply chains, specifically with chips, and then what happens over the next six months or so, and then strategic. What about right now? How bad is the situation? Is it getting better? What, where are we? Yeah, David, thank you. Again, thank you for having me as always. As far as right now, I think you had a great quote in our lead-in, which was from uh, the Fed President, Neil Kashkari, which is about Malaysia and how things are improving, at least in automotive chips. And things are improving, but it takes time to work through the, the supply and demand balance uh, that'll occur. But things are getting better. They're loosening up. Once we solve the chip problem, There'll be other problems called packaging, but that's more of a, in the IT segment versus the consumer segment, like automotive or appliances. But things are improving. But we have a, we have a ways to go, and, the, and companies need to do things differently as we as we go out to the future. What can companies do to try to ameliorate the problem, if not fix it entirely, over say the next six months? I think the thing that they I think they are doing, quite honestly, and they've started to do. I think you've seen this in some of their products. They're, they're working on design and supply. You have to do both. By that, I mean you have to reduce the demand to get in balance with the supply that is available. On the design side, you'll see them using fewer chips or maybe consolidating functions within a chip or a board, as it's called, so that you can use fewer chips to, to get the same functionality in the product. At the same time, companies will, will make long-term commitments to their suppliers, form partnerships. I believe Ford announced one this morning with Global Foundries is a good example of that, where they're going to make long-term supply commitments. And on both parties, I mean, clearly, perhaps to cost them a little more, having been in this business on both sides, both a buyer and a supplier, I guess costs could go up, but you're much, be you're much better off having quality products that you can ship to your customers, even if, uh, even if it has a small cost impact. So Sam, on the redesign point, I think I mentioned to you actually, I went and looked at a Ford Maverick, this new small pickup, and they went out of the way yes. to say, you know what, we made the screen smaller, it's now a key ignition, remember we used to have those instead of push button, yes. specifically to reduce the semiconductor needs for the vehicle. How fast can a manufacturer really retool? Well, it depends. If it's a software change, they can do it I mean, pretty quickly, immediately, like next year's models, for example, you know, right? If it's a hardware change where it requires bending metal, you know, for example, then it, yeah, it's a little more complicated because you, now you're doing it through manufacturing line. But quite honestly, the changes that they've made, like screen, you buy a smaller screen size and you use a key versus a push button, that's, that's mostly software. So Sam, you also mentioned strategic relationships such as Ford and Global Foundries that's been announced now. Uh, give us a sense of the spectrum from let's do it in-house because there's some, been talk, some talk we'll design the chips inside, inside our own company, even if you're an automotive company, to have yes. a strategic relationship to actually just be a customer. How do you decide among those alternatives if you uh, need the chips? I, I tell you, the way I always think about it, I'd start with, your product differentiation, you know, how do you make yourself competitive versus your competitors, their offerings, and, and then therefore capital allocation, i.e. in a fab itself. So I'll start with the fab itself. These, even a small fab today is three to four billion dollars. One that Intel will build is probably eight to nine billion. IBM were five to six billion. So it's a huge capital allocation. And therefore it requires a lot of volume for that fab to make sense. So therefore, if you're not in that industry, you're probably not going to build your own fab. You can reserve capacity with a partner. You can you know, pay for that amount allocation of their manufacturing capacity is the term. But I, I would not recommend they go out and build their own fabs. It's really, really technical. They're talking about uh, five nanometer. It's basically, it's like three atoms on a circuit and things like that. It's extremely hard to do. Now on the other side where you can get great differentiation is around design. And a lot can be done on design, and you have to work with your partner because that becomes part of the uh, the uh, the data that they load into the chip. You know the, the the algorithms for the how the chip works. But nonetheless, as you partner with your uh, your whomever your foundry is, whether it's Global Foundries or Intel or uh, Samsung, and there's multiple TSMC, etc. Uh, my point being is you can get terrific different differentiation through design. If you look at AMD and their stock. Uh, you know, they've moved more to a design shop than a fab, and you can see their stock is up tremendously because of their success there. Uh, Sam, we were talking about what, the now, here and now, and then the near future. What about the longer future? What are the strategic solution here? And if I can, you'll tell me if this makes sense. Can we divide it into what's good for business and the economy and then turn to national security? Because I think they may be somewhat different considerations. Yes, the, the, yes, they are, but they do converge. But that's, that's an excellent observation on your part, Dave, because they eventually do converge. I mean, if you think about it today, 
which we're seeing for the first time that data and semiconductors are the lifeblood of the economy and also important to national security, but they are the lifeblood of the economy. It's like the oil of the 21st century, of the past, but now applied to the 21st century. So having said all that, you know, we need to have strategic relationships to, I would say, secure that capacity that, that protects the U.S. economy. Uh, that means we have to relocate, which gets us back to the na national security issue, but we need to bring more of the capacity back into the Northern Hemisphere or, or, or maybe our allies around the world. We can just discuss whether they have capability or not. That's a long conversation I wouldn't bore your audience with. But having said that, over 75% of the worldwide capacity today is in Asia, Taiwan, Singapore, Korea. We, that needs to be coming back to the United States, at least to solve the needs of the companies and in and, that and country, quite honestly, our society in the United States. The reason why I say it converges is because that movement back to the United States, that's why you hear about in this, the, the bill that was the Schumer bill that's now being worked through the House and the Senate, the $52 billion, requires government involvement because it's a significant investment to bring those fabs back into the United States. Uh, it's both the fab itself and, and the future R&D. So that's where it all connects because it's those facilities that are going to be about both doing commercial work as well as work for, I'll uh, call the, the protection of our company, national, a country rather, national security. Uh, Sam, I believe that bill is called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act. Originally, a version of it was called the CHIPS Act. It's a little bit mired right now. Passed through the Senate, the House is having troubles with it. But the $52 billion you referred to, is that enough to make a material difference? I've heard some of the chip producers say, we can't do it without it. Is it enough to get us to where we need to go? I think it's enough to do production. Now, there's a whole other element of this thing called re research and design or research and development, right? That's in the back, Build Back Better bill, which they're talking about $190 billion, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure if that's a good number or a bad number, but they need to do probably twice as much of production in research and design because the point is that the way these chips are used in the future, it's very, very advanced research. You have to have the money to fund it. You need the academic relationships with the appropriate universities to help you work on these kinds of solutions. And it's really a three-way partnership between government, academia, and business. But that research bill is uh, every bit as important as the production bill. Now, it's clear that the focus today is on production because we don't have the supply to meet the demand. But that will be solved. And then in the $50 billion, I think will make us more secure and resilient. But we need to address the long-term requirements uh, to be competitive as a country. That's both commercially and national security of the, or of the government, because the Chinese are outspending us dramatically. 